If you're going to mediation soon or you have clients who are, consider pre-mediation coaching with us at High Conflict Institute. This is a brand new service we're providing and here's why. Most people are unsure what will happen in mediation and how to prepare for it, especially in a high conflict mediation. Studies show that regardless of the skill level of your mediator, learning a few key conflict resolution skills can increase your success of settling your matter out of court. Our pre-mediation coach will work with you in a 90-minute one-on-one session by Zoom or phone to help you learn to stay calm, to make reasonable proposals, and make decisions that can last. A small investment with significant positive outcomes. Schedule your pre-mediation coaching session on our website at the link below in the show notes or call us at 619-800-2070. If you're a lawyer, mediator, or other professional and want more info, just ask us at highconflictinstitute.com on our contact page or feel free to provide the coaching link directly to your clients today. Welcome to It's All Your Fault on True Story FM, the one and only podcast dedicated to helping you identify and deal with some really challenging people and situations, the most difficult of difficult people, those with high conflict personalities. I'm Megan Hunter, and I'm here with my co-host, Bill Eddy. Hi, everybody. And we're the co-founders of the High Conflict Institute in San Diego, California. In today's episode, we continue with part two of the domestic violence series with my co-host, Bill Eddy, attorney Annette Burns, and Judge Karen Adam. But first, we have a few quick reminders. Here's the deal. We want to hear from you. Have you dealt with a high conflict situation, been blamed, experienced violence or abuse from an HCP? Or maybe you simply dread seeing that person again, but probably have to tonight at home or tomorrow at work. Send us your questions, and we just might discuss them on the show. You can submit them by clicking the Submit a Question button at our website, highconflictinstitute.com slash podcast, or emailing us at podcast at highconflictinstitute.com, and you can drop them on any of our socials. You can find all the show notes and links at highconflictinstitute.com slash podcast as well. Make sure you subscribe, rate, and review, and please tell all your friends about us. Telling just one person that you like the show and where they can find it is the best way you can help us out and help more people learn how to address high conflict people. We appreciate you so very much. And now on with today's show. Welcome back to part two of the DV series. We'll continue the discussion about a six-part video series in which Bill, Karen, and Annette interviewed 16 domestic violence experts. If you haven't listened to part one and met these three really amazing people um, in part one, that's okay. You can listen to that episode anytime, and you can read more about um, our guests in the show notes along with a link to the video series that they're discussing. So we're just going to get right to it today. All right. The first question will go to Annette Burns, who is a family law attorney. And and Annette, thanks for coming back for episode two. (laughs) So why should lawyers and mediators screen um, all of their cases for DV? This was a really important uh, area of the discussion and the interviews for me, because uh, not only am I an attorney in private practice, but I do a lot of dispute resolution, like mediation. So this was really crucial. I can't tell you how many times when I was acting as a neutral, like a parenting coordinator or a mediator, and it would come up during the dispute resolution process that there's been some degree of violence or IPV in the relationship, and it had apparently not been addressed previously. So the screening issue was crucial to me. When we're sitting in our offices as attorneys and people come in for that uh, initial appointment to find out about a divorce or a paternity matter and child custody, it may not come up. Um, It's not, we can't assume that people are going to bring it up on their own unless the professional asks about it. Um, Sometimes the issue even comes up post court orders after orders have been entered for parenting time and no one's ever addressed uh, violence in the relationship, but the parties are still dealing with it and the parenting plan is still showing that it's being dealt with. So 
uh, it, the screening and the discussions about it were so great for me. We talked about MASIC, M-A-S-I-C, as a screening tool. We talked about other questionnaires. We talked about the terrific resources available on the Battered Women's Justice Project website, the safer uh, information and screenings they have. Um, so I probably fell into a mistaken belief that, uh, oh, if I'm, if I'm representing a person, I'm never going to force them to be in the same room as the abuser, so we're okay. Um, they're safe. But unless I do that screening, I don't know how to keep them safe, either when I'm representing them or in a mediation. So, and I fell into uh, what I now believe is a mistaken belief that when I'm a mediator, and if we're doing mediation by Zoom or strictly shuttle mediation, that that's keeping a survivor of domestic violence safe. And I no longer believe that as the result of these interviews and all the information we have. Uh, Bill mentioned a little bit of it in the earlier uh, podcast, part one of this, uh, that we can't assume that. There's still a lot more going on, and just being on Zoom with a survivor and an abuser on the same Zoom, that doesn't protect anyone. There's still a lot going on there. What was that called? Absence presence? A, a, absent presence. Absent yes. presence, yes. Bill referred to it better than I am. But and, and Loretta Frederick, when she was talking about this, she said... Uh, we carry around this perennial hope as professionals that uh, people can get their acts together and they can behave okay, either in a court setting or a mediation setting, it, that somehow whatever went before won't come up again because there's other people present. And that's just not realistic. I think we call that wishful thinking, don't we? Exactly. <laughs> and, well, it's the, well, Loretta said perennial hope, and I liked mm. that. <laughs> we are hopeful, but it's unrealistic. For a lot of these cases so again the screening is imperative so we know going in what we're dealing with what our client is either accused of or what our client has gone through depending who we represent and so based on the interviews and all the information we got i've concluded that this screening and we all pick our individual kinds of screenings there are uh, professional ones like MASIC we can go to, but most of us develop our own uh, our own procedure for that. We've got to do it in every case. It's not going to come up organically. Sorry, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just not. <laughs> oh, that's so so important to know. And and uh, in this video, uh, we have a whole section on those different types of, of screening tools. So you can, you know, get those from that video. And then, you know, if you need to adapt it a little bit for your own practice, that's, that's a good place to start. So Karen, let's talk now about the courts a bit. Let's, what's the importance of the courts or for the courts in receiving a full picture of domestic violence? I couldn't have had a better intro than what Annette just said, because if it applies, <laughs> if it applies to lawyers and mediators, it applies to judges and is maybe even more critical because the judge is making the decisions, all sorts of decisions and all sorts of decisions that are impacted by domestic violence. People don't think about it, but child support, the division of debts and assets, whether to award spousal maintenance or alimony, as it's called in some places, how to divide up the parenting time. Uh, all of those things are greatly impacted by the presence of domestic violence. And if you don't have all the information, you can't make full and fair decision. Getting the information is really, really challenging, especially since in about 85 to 90 percent of family law cases and in many other types of cases across the board, civil, probate, uh, child support, and some cases in uh, juvenile court as well, people are self-represented. And these issues are really challenging to present appropriately to the court. And not everybody is confident enough or um, uh, has the right tools to gather the evidence that's appropriate and will be admissible, and then to present that evidence in court in a way that will convince the court. And then I have to hearken back to what I said about the variation between and among benches and judges on what will be acceptable, what won't be acceptable, how willing is a judge to uh, allow the relaxed rules of evidence to apply in a case, with, especially with self-represented litigants, 
Is someone going to be a complete stickler and um, just stonewall the person attempting to present evidence either side? Uh, and so it's really, really important for judges to know what to look for. Judges can ask questions. You can ask questions in every single kind of case. Of course, you can't step over the line and ask a question that's going to supply the one missing element in a criminal case, for example. But you can ask questions in deciding whether to issue an order of protection. You can ask questions in deciding uh, what kind of a parenting plan to issue, as long as you're fair to both litigants, as long as you ask the same questions when they're appropriate of both litigants, you're allowed to do that and you should do that to get the whole picture because you want to make orders that are that are lawful, that are enforceable, and that uh, allow families to move forward safely to ensure that children are protected, to ensure that survivors are protected. And you can't do that unless you have all of the information. That must be a, a pretty tough place to be, um, hearing allegations of, of domestic violence and not knowing whether they're they're true or false. And, and, you know, and it leads me to think about just being a human sitting on the bench, right? Our, we all bring bias. And I know there's a, a ton of of uh, bias training, but what would you say about that? How how can a judge avoid bias in domestic violence cases? Okay, I used to teach that <laughs> <laughs> Huge topic. I have no idea how you convince people really to uh, to set aside all the little decisions that are being made in their brains that they don't even know about. I mean, however many thousands of thoughts go through your brain and all of these things called heuristics, which are brain shortcuts, which happen to everybody and happen, especially when you're under stress, when you're in a time crunch and when you're dealing with really, really challenging topics. So voila, a domestic violence case on a packed calendar uh, when people are maybe acting out, maybe very emotional and where the judge is expected to be superhuman and um, perform a her sort of a Herculean task of wading through all of that to get to um, the truth or to get to what the real issues are or to try to at least make a decision that's going to ensure everyone's safety. It's really, really challenging. And I tell you, I remember in the beginning, as I mentioned in part one, about 1981 or so, when courts and lawyers started really paying attention to domestic violence. Um, and for 20 years after that, people, judges and court personnel hated domestic violence cases. I remember being at a judicial conference and probably 1984, 1985, and Sarah Buell, what at the time and still a renowned expert in domestic violence and a fabulous speaker had a three-hour session at our bar con uh, judicial conference. And judges were furious that they didn't, they know this, they don't need to be told how to act on and on and on. Now, when you do a domestic violence training, they're oversold. Judges want to know, they want to make the right decisions. It's really, really shifted. It's not that everybody is still um, doing what we would all consider to be the right thing every time. But judges are very, very interested in this topic, very committed to it. I think largely because so many judges um, come from the practice. And if you end up in family law, uh, family court, hopefully you've had family law experience um, or you've had a criminal practice and you've had someone who's been involved in a domestic violence situation. It has definitely changed, but it is still one of those topics that makes people kind of shudder and get really anxious because there are so many variables and because you don't want to do the wrong thing. You don't want to be that judge. That's a tough 
tough place to be. <laughs> so it, I, I, I'm glad there are screening tools and um, and a lot of training and, and education. And I know you've been a big part of ad- advancing that in this country. Um, now, Annette, how can family lawyers impact cases with with DV? Well, they can impact them in very negative ways and in positive ways. So hopefully uh, the interviews we did and the information we got leans towards the positive. I'll start with a negative though, because this is what we see a lot at what family law attorneys can do. We're under terrific time constraints when we go to court in family law, especially. And I think very often lawyers tend to say real negative things to their clients who may be a survivor and say, we don't have time to cover that. Don't go into that. The judge doesn't want to hear that. It's irrelevant. And by saying these things to a domestic violence survivor, we're just, we're doing, we're doing a lot more harm. Now, we have to balance that with the practicalities of if we only have a one hour hearing in front of a judge, we can educate our clients and say, we have 60 minutes. So let's talk about how we're going to use that 60 minutes. Um, Yes, you need to tell your story, but we need to do it in 10 minutes. (laughs) And then we need to talk about the children and what's going on with the children for a while. So I I think we can do it better than we're doing. Obviously, one of the best uh, situations would be if we have more time in front of a judge. But right now, that's not really happening. So that's some of the negative things we do. Um, I, I think positively going forward as attorneys, we can recognize by the time the domestic violence survivor gets to us, we're not the first line of, of person they've talked to about this. We're kind of far down on the totem pole. They've already presumably talked to family and friends about what they've gone through, hopefully. They may have talked to the police. They may have talked to medical providers. Um, by the time they get to us, they may have, they may be all talked out. They may have told their story and nothing much has happened. And, and they're feeling like everyone's going to ignore them unless we ask. So they may not bring it up, the, the things they've gone through, unless we bring it up first. So that goes back to the screening and actually asking the questions. They've also been in a culture where they've been taught that things like this are kept secret. You don't talk about, so maybe they haven't talked to anyone at all, and they're not going to talk to a lawyer either. So again, asking the questions and taking them out of that culture of silence and the culture of let's hide this um, is is very important. And of course, that comes up when you're representing children too, either as a best interest attorney or a child's attorney. They've been taught they don't talk about this. They are not to bring it up with teachers, doctors, anyone. So it's very hard to get the information out. So those are some things that family lawyers can educate themselves to do uh, to try to help. And in conjunction with working with my client in how to present this to the court and that it may be in a very limited amount of time, uh, also making sure that my client is getting appropriate counseling where they can talk about the experience and not be limited to 10 minutes. Uh, There's other ways they can do that without um, being in front of a judge. So I think those are the most important things we can try and move forward. <laughs> I think we're asking a lot of lawyers, right, in, in these situations. It's, a, it's, it's just a, a lot to handle. But We're asking a lot of everyone. We're asking mm. a lot of the judges. But uh, hearing from the domestic violence advocates during these interviews was really, really helpful to me because they are more the frontline people and telling us what these survivors need and when they need it. That was incredibly helpful to me as an attorney. Good, good. So, Bill, we haven't talked about one important role in uh, family law cases, and that is the role of, of therapists and mental health professionals. And there are many roles they take in in family law cases. So what kind of impact can they have in cases with domestic violence? Well, we, we heard from people treating abusers, people treating children, um, people with with other clients. So there's really an aspect for each, I would say, since I was a therapist for a dozen years. Uh, one of the first things is to talk about couples therapists, because many cases that uh, end up in couples therapy may have domestic violence in them. And I think that therapists should also 
be inquiring of the clients, just like family lawyers and mediators should be, to do some screening. Because if you help a couple work out a, a, a behavioral agreement and have no idea that there's domestic violence going on, uh, one of the parties may be punished for bringing up issues uh, during the session. So it'd be important for therapists to also have a separate screening session um, at some point in the process, ideally at the beginning. Now, individual therapists, as we learn for lawyers, that uh, survivors of domestic violence don't bring up domestic violence in many cases. So they may be seeing a therapist for weeks and weeks, and then, oh, and by the way, <laughs> so, and it's not just saying, are you, have you been a victim of domestic violence? That's probably the question that most people think of, because they're, they often say no. And yet, if you ask specific questions, well, have have you ever had a fight where you were pushed or shoved? And, oh, yeah, we had that. Did, did the other person ever try to strangle you? Um, yeah, but, you know, I just said, please stop, and they stopped. Well, that's a huge uh, warning sign of potential difficulty. That's one of the biggest warning signs for potential spousal murder. So it's important to ask specific questions. Have you been uh, stalked? Have you been controlled, isolated, all of those things? Do you have fear? Because in any counseling, you want to know that. You don't want to end up reading about your client in the newspaper or hearing about it on TV one day. And so, you know, that's so important. The children, I thought that was very powerful, the interview we had with a therapist with children, because she was talking about really how children carry so much sense of responsibility. I should have put my toys away. I should have cleaned up, you know, and, and they all want to try harder. And just having therapists really be able to empathize with what the kids are going through and not rush them to suddenly, you know, pour everything out. And that's just scratching the surface. If they see the series, they'll get a lot more. Oh, I know, therapy with offenders. And this is something that's so important, uh, hearing what the programs are. And I think we all agree that like a year-long program is a good place to start, um, especially with coercive controlling violence. And so those types of programs, people really need to know what they're doing or they're going to easily be manipulated uh, because coercive controllers are manipulators. They manipulate into relationships and then they re manipulate during the relationship. And the manipulation continues during the mediations often. When we start talking about property, even taking it away from children for the moment, property and the coercive controller is going to keep control of all the property. Well, I'm going to dole it out. She can't handle it. She'd spend it all. And then it starts to come out in in other ways. Wow, this is this is IPV screening. This is long-term coercive control. When you find out that literally one person has never had access to more than a few hundred dollars a week that's doled out. And uh, that's that's the main reason we should be doing this screening up front in mediations before it comes out in the property division. Good point. So let's talk about mediation. Is uh, you know either Bill or Annette can answer this. Is I know Annette, you do a lot of of uh, mediation, and and Bill has written the book <laughs> on medi mediation in high conflict disputes. So is it appropriate? Is mediation appropriate when domestic violence is involved? Well, I think this is one of the biggest areas I wanted to hear about in the series, and we have a whole hour on this, so I'll try to give you the two- or three-minute version. And that is, yes, in many cases, mediation is appropriate. In some cases, it's, it's better than court because people feel safer from not having to see each other. If and Because you can do shuttle mediation, which some study that we heard about seemed to be a real preference for a lot of uh, survivors that um, they don't have to see the other person. And you can do shuttle mediation on video conferencing. And Bill, what's, what's shuttle mediation for those who don't know? 
that's where you go back and forth with each party rather than having them together. So I did uh, some domestic violence mediation before COVID where I went back two different rooms in our same mediation center. And I would discuss an issue with one and then give them some things to think about and go back and meet with the other. So they never were face to face. And so they didn't have that face to face fear element. Although, let me emphasize that some cases aren't appropriate, even for shuttle, because of that absent presence that something may happen afterwards and that they may be punished for raising an issue, proposing something, you know, and, and as Annette said, there's property issues like retirements that may be, you know, by law 50-50, and yet a person who earns that, often uh, the man, may feel that that's my retirement, and how dare you ask for that, even if the law says you can and so that's an example of a common uh, power struggle issue. So the, the question is the screening. The screening really needs to identify, is there a sense of danger? Is there a sense of danger that can occur after the mediation? And can you be together? If it's situational couple violence, I've mediated a lot of those cases with an incident of domestic violence. There's a restraining order and there's an exception for for mediation. And I only did it if there was an exception for mediation, because otherwise they have to be a hundred yards away from each other. But those many of those cases were appropriately mediated. The parties preferred mediation. They were pleased with the outcome. It was fairly standard, and it worked well. But there are some that aren't appropriate, and the screening must be done. And I must admit, as a mediator for 40 years, that the first 35 years, I didn't do that. And so I got some training in that and woke up to, there's a lot of cases with domestic violence in them that I never knew about. In Canada, they required uh, divorce mediators to screen. In the United States, they don't. But I think really that's coming because this is so important. Mm. Absolutely. So let's then shift into um, the the children that, you know, are impacted by situations like this. So um, how can children's concerns be addressed in mediation? There's uh, some studies and research that have come up with some good ideas. And one of the best ideas is having someone who's well-trained in interviewing children meet with children and then meet with the mediator and the parents and talk about taking the children's concerns into account without necessarily revealing word for word what the children said, because children may be in a position of danger as well. And so that approach um, seems to be incorporated in some really good programs of mediation. So they have, it's, it's child-inclusive mediation gets their thoughts included, but they're not sitting in the mediation session. And I think with domestic violence cases that that's the wisest approach. And it was emphasized to us, you need someone who's trained in doing those interviews with children, not just anybody, to understand what the kids are going through and to communicate it to the parents in a way that's protective and realistic. Okay. Let me add something I want to add. There's another difference between the U.S. and Canada. Canada is subscribed to the, uh, there's an international convention on children's rights that they've subscribed to so that the voice of the child should be heard in any legal case that impacts the children. The U.S. did not sign on to that, but many judges, evaluators, et cetera, are interested in the children's opinion, um, again, I think it should come from an experienced person. A lot of judges don't want to do that themselves, and I agree because they're not trained in that. So an experienced person is the one who really should get that information. Mm. And Judge Adam, what should family law professionals know about kids and DV? You've 
worked on the uh, the youth bench. <laughs> I don't know if it's called youth bench, but youth uh, court, and um, and seeing kids in in many different areas of your work. First, I wanted to just add to what Bill just said. It's the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and the U.S. is now the only country that has not signed. Wow. Yes. <laughs> and so um, it just has to go through Congress, and it's just always been a very, very heavy lift. But at any rate, that doesn't mean that there aren't scores and scores of people who've written about the importance of the voice of the child and people who are completely committed to uh, children being heard. I mentioned that I started uh, on the Superior Court bench in juvenile court where every child has a lawyer in Pima County, uh, which is Tucson. And um, in other parts of the state, every child in child welfare has a guardian ad litem or court-appointed special advocate. Every child has someone who will be their voice in court. Uh, because I had years of experience with children being represented by counsel, I have a real preference for lawyers for children. I want the person who is representing the child to have the right to file pleadings, to be able to make arguments, to file an appeal, and to represent the child's wishes, not to substitute their judgment for what is in the child's best interest. Um, some people, some judges are anxious about that. Uh, they want to know what is in the child's best interest, not being comfortable in making that de decision themselves. I always trusted in my ability to decide based on the information that I had, hopefully what was in the best interest of the child. So it's really, really important that children be heard in, um, in these cases, especially. And as I mentioned, with so many cases around the world involving people representing themselves, especially in cases of substance use disorder, including alcohol, mental health issues, and domestic violence, it's really, really important that the children have some sort of official voice in the proceedings, or you are never going to hear what's really going on. And the information that um, a judge can learn from either interviewing a child, which I was very comfortable doing, or hearing from a lawyer for the child or a representative for the child is invaluable in these cases in determining what is actually happening in the home, uh, because kids are more honest than, than adults often, and um, also in determining what would make them feel safe? So it's really important that judges know what children are thinking and feeling and saying about what's happening so that they can make decisions that ensure safety. Best interest of the child is still one of the factors that judges are required to consider when making decisions in, in our state and in most states around custody, parenting time, um, and other family law issues. And certainly it's an issue in child welfare and in um, youth justice as well. It used to be the number two uh, criteria in uh, in Arizona. Now it's down the list a little ways, but it's still important to know what uh, is it. The judge has to decide what's in the best interest of the child. That has to be over the overarching consideration. So it is really, really important uh, that family law professionals understand the impact of domestic violence on children. And, uh, and it's real. And it's, it's very, very uh, complicated. But what we know is that in about 75% of the cases where children uh, observe violence in the home, they go on to become abusers themselves. Um, and so it's very, very important that, that the family law professionals all recognize that what happens in the home is having a dramatic impact on the children. There are still professionals who say the child wasn't in the room when this happened. Um, and when you talk to children who have lain in bed and tried to cover their heads and block their ears so that they don't even hear, don't even hear a fight, much less a violent fight. None of us like to hear. Probably, I'll make a I'll make a leap like Annette did. So not only are we not personality disordered, but we probably also really don't like being around a lot of high conflict. 
And um, imagine being a child and hearing the people that you love most in the world fighting with each other, using terrible language, and then add on to that, you actually see or maybe even try to intervene in acts of violence. The, the impacts are going to be huge and they are going to be long lasting. And it's really, really important that everybody involved in the case, including the judges, appreciate those impacts. Yeah, because they are they are lifelong and <laughs> they can be lifelong and, and uh, those poor kids and their future relationships. I wanted to add something before it, it, it passes, and that is we need to understand that the kids may have been influenced by their parents, one or the other against the other. So it's good to have someone who really knows what they're doing to be able to filter that out. It's not just the impact on the kids, but also what the kids say may be very much what they've been told to say or what they feel they have to say because of their own fear, just like their parents. So just want to get that in there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's talk a little more about, um, you know, family court. Annette, what did you learn about parenting plants in this video series? I, I know you have a ton of experience of your own. So um, did you learn anything new? Yeah, uh, as far as creating parenting plans for parents who are involved in these situations, um, we've always known kind of the obvious things. We can't have in-person exchanges. We have to protect everyone at the exchanges, especially the children. Um, use third parties and public places when possible. We knew the obvious about that. Um, one thing we learned and that I've actually seen is when the parents are separated because of domestic violence concerns, their communication is also cut off concerning the children. And when a child is having problems, whether it's at the school or in counseling or medical problems with a provider, the, the school or those people want to talk to the parents jointly, both to give out information about the child and to get some feedback about what everybody should do. In these um, situations, sometimes the parents either refuse to have a joint conversation, even on the telephone or online, or they're prohibited by a court order from having any kind of joint conversation. And who loses out in all this? The child. The child isn't getting help he needs at school or through counseling. So what are the alternatives when we're creating parenting plans that involve these situations? What alternatives or what provisions can we put in? Will the parents, can they safely agree to do at least some minimal telephonic or virtual communication just about the child? Can they bring in a third party who maybe can shuttle between the two of them to talk just about the child? We need to think about these really specific things for IPV and domestic violence situations that other parenting plans take for granted, that the parents are gonna talk and, and communicate once in a while. So, and like I said, we also have the obvious things like keep the parents apart and do exchanges through school whenever possible, but don't forget that there are non-school days, that there are days when a child's home sick, that you can't use the school or the daycare as the exchange. And don't forget, uh, we need to name some alternative for those days, or that's where the problems arise, when the parents can't rely on the third party school to handle it. So it's a lot to think about. Yeah, <clears throat> those are some really good tips. Uh, now let's transition into that all important topic of, of treatment for domestic violence. Bill, do you want to talk about that a bit? And, and uh, I'll ask you the same question I asked Annette. Did you learn anything new about treatment from this series? Well, what I've really wondered was how successful are treatments. And so one of, one of the experts was speaking, Dr. Wexler, about um, treating offenders and in year-long programs, basically, um, because that's what's necessary. And I was encouraged to hear that he sees maybe 70% make progress, but that there's, I wasn't surprised to hear there's about 30% that they really don't touch. And so the treatment itself, you know, building empathy for, for partners, building empathy for the kids, he says we do see success with that. And one of the biggest things is that most offenders don't want to see their children become 
abusers or abused. And that's one of the things that really impacts them and I think impacts their thinking throughout the divorce process is I want to do this. And especially with parenting plans, I want to do this so that the kids don't end up repeating what I've been doing. That's the kind of thinking that they really help with. So I'm encouraged that there's 70% that may make progress. Um, Not surprised there's 30%. I think people tend to have an all or nothing view and say, oh, treatment never works. Or, of course, he had treatment, so everything's wonderful now. It's much more nuanced than that. So that gives us all some hope that, uh, you know, getting people away from that all or nothing thinking and into um, understanding there are treatments available. And, you know, wherever you are in the world, seek those out in your jurisdiction, find out what's available um, and what works. So we're almost done with this really important topic, but I don't want to leave it without talking about something that's very, very important, and that's self-care. When you are a professional who deals with a lot of uh, clients who are experiencing domestic violence in any role you're in, it's going to impact you. And uh, so I know Karen, uh, Judge Adam here has has talked quite a bit and written extensively on self-care and, and uh, one aspect of it in particular called vicarious trauma. So Karen, leave us with some thoughts on that. As you probably have gathered by listening to us talk about this work, it's very, very difficult. And all of us have to do it We are uh, judges, lawyers, mental health professionals, mediators. We have to do it um, with a complete sense of neutrality and a complete uh, suspension of normal human emotions. Most people, when hearing some of the things that we hear, would scream, yell, stare, start crying, or want to um, curl up in a ball. We in the field have to continue on. We have to continue representing our client. We have to continue uh, conducting a mediation. We have to continue with a therapy session. We have to make a decision as a judge and we have to maintain respect uh, for the litigants and dig the courtroom. And that involves stuffing a lot, keeping our uh, real emotions and our real feelings Um, at a lower level and maintaining this uh, persona of neutrality throughout whatever the proceeding is that we're involved in. That can take a huge toll. The best description I ever heard of it was that uh, you have to, this is from uh, Dr. Kathleen West, is you have to uh, maintain that control while you're in the situation, but you have to remember to turn the switch to your humanity back on when you are out of the situation. And it just becomes easier and easier the longer you do the work to just keep yourself um, kind of in that mode where nothing bothers you. Um, Because you're going to have to go right back into it you know, an hour later or a day later or whenever it is you're back in the courtroom or back with your client or back in mediation, whatever the setting might be. And that's the danger is keeping your uh, the switch turned off and keeping yourself um, unaffected. Well, you think you're unaffected. You act like you're unaffected. But in fact, it is taking a tremendous toll on you as a human being. You can lose your ability to feel. You can lose your ability to sleep. You can lose your ability to focus. You can drink too much, eat too much, gamble too much. There are just so many ways that vicarious trauma can manifest itself in a way that is uh, very counterproductive and uh, very negative in terms of your physical, emotional, and mental health. So it's really important when you're doing this work to pay attention to how you're feeling. If you know that you have any of those issues with sleeping, eating, drinking, uh, relating to your loved ones, if you're detached uh, from friends, if you're not engaged in your usual activities, you're not exercising, ask some questions. There's lots of great information out there. I'll make sure that Megan has um, some of the easy checklists uh, that you can look at. There's lots that's been written about this topic. And it's really important, especially in um, 
cases involving domestic violence uh, or involving substance use disorder, or involving mental health issues, all of which often collide uh, and um, and appear together in these these kinds of cases. It's it's usually not just one thing that we're working with when when these cases come before us. So really important to take to take really good care of yourselves. Thank you, Karen. I, I'm sure Bill and Annette can um, <laughs> can agree with the toll that this takes on on people. So it's just really important for everyone to take care of themselves, um, whatever role you're in. Like we did in the first episode, I'd like to ask Judge Adam to again talk to anyone listening who might be in a domestic violence situation now. Of all the people who need to take care of themselves, the most important people are uh, those who have been impacted by domestic violence, of course. If you are in a situation uh, where you are uh, being abused or where there is coercive control, we are very concerned that you are safe and that you feel safe. Um, If you are in a situation right now where there's immediate danger, obviously you must call uh, law enforcement. If you are in a situation where you believe there is um, domestic violence or coercive control, but you are not in immediate danger, but you wish to have some help, you should call the domestic violence hotline uh, in the location where you are. In the United States, it's 1-800-799-7233. You can also go online to thehotline.org, all one word, um, and you can text 88788. The word start will get you connected with uh, experts who will help you um, move forward with uh, your um, uh, domestic violence issues and help you develop a safety plan and a way to um, manage what is going on in your life. So please be safe and feel safe. Thank you. And with that, we wrap up this very important domestic violence series. First, I'd like to, to thank Judge Adam, Annette Burns, and Bill Eddy, who devoted a tremendous amount of time to interviewing our 16 experts. And without the you 16 experts, we wouldn't have had this series. So um, I just want to say a big thank you to um, all of those who participated in this video. It's an important one and uh, will be very helpful to many. I know this has been packed with a lot of information, these, this series of two episodes. So go back and listen again anytime and just know we'll touch on this topic again in future episodes down the road. You'll find the links to the DV video series and our guest bios and the 16 experts bios, along with some other DV resources in the show notes. And in next week's episode, we'll focus entirely on your questions, the questions you've submitted. You asked and we'll answer. You won't want to miss it. Remember to rate and review us and tell your friends and colleagues about us. It means a lot. Thanks for listening, and we hope our words impact your life in a positive way. Don't forget to enjoy every day as you work toward understanding humans. Most importantly, use our words to find the missing P-E-A-C-E, peace. It's All Your Fault is a production of True Story FM. Engineering by Andy Nelson. Music by Wolf Samuels, John Coggins, and Ziv Moran. Find the show, show notes, and transcripts at truestory.fm or highconflictinstitute.com slash podcast. If your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, please consider doing that for our show. Mm-hmm.